Okay, another thing that people say, you need to eat a balanced diet. You need yep. to have moderation. You need to have balance between carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Not too much of each. A good balanced diet will include all of those things. What, what is your response to that? Well, my response to that is that it's complete and utter hogwash. It's nonsense. Let's see, it's, it's a great piece of marketing. It's an awesome piece of marketing. Um, you take a powerful concept, a powerful construct, again, a construct, that people relate to balance. Balance is thought of to be equated with goodness and light and everything that we should aspire to in the universe. Goodness, the lady of justice even has a pair of scales in one hand because, you know, justice and goodness and light is all about balance. Here's the thing though, here's the problem with that. Every single animal on this planet, including human beings, has evolved over, over a significant period of time on this planet, four billion years, give or take, in a specific niche. Okay? What do, um, what do cats eat? Well, they're carnivores. We know that because they have sharp, pointy teeth like this. And they catch things and kill them and eat them. Okay. Um, what do blue whales eat? Well, they eat plankton. They don't have sharp pointy teeth, but they're still a carnivore. Interesting, isn't it? The biggest carnivore on the planet. No teeth. I actually all. didn't even think about that. That's a good point. No teeth. I mean, all these people that say, oh, it can't be a carnivore because look, we don't have sharp pointy teeth like this. Well, that's awesome. Blue whale. Would somebody like to say, they haven't got the memo. Let them know that they should stop eating plankton immediately because <laughs> they don't have sharp pointy teeth. What about the hagfish? The hagfish is a, is a scavenger that eats dead whales mostly. They have an opening at the front of their body that's kind of like a mouth, never closes. It's got no teeth in it, just raspy pads to get the rotting flesh off the dead animals. That, somebody tell them they're on a carnivore too. How about birds of prey? They only have a beak, no sharp pointy teeth. They do have the claws, mind, but, you know, animals have, every animal has evolved in a niche with a technique of feeding themselves. Now, what I say to these people that say we can't be carnivores because look at our teeth. I go, well, number one, we evolved from animals that ate fruit and lived in trees, and there was no negative selection pressure that would cause our body format to change shape so that we do have sharp pointy teeth. Here's why. We have a brain. We have the ability to communicate with one another. We have opposable thumbs and can fashion tools like sharp pointy sticks. We can throw stones. We can string guts of animals across sticks and fire other pointy sticks. We can work together, we can yell and scream and make a lot of noise and we can scare animals and, you know, all of that. So we don't need sharp pointy teeth. I have never seen a cave painting of hunting men diving at woolly mammoths with their mouths open. They've always got sharp pointy sticks. That's our technique. We've, we, we developed with that. That's, that's how we've evolved. And then you look at our organ systems, our body plan, our metabolic pathways the structures in our digestive system and we do some comparative anatomy and physiology and we go geez we look we look much more like a carnivore than we look like a herbivore in any way shape or form um and then you go to something like stable isotope testing and stable isotope testing is done with nitrogen isotopes found in the long bones of skeletal remains of humans found anywhere on the planet of any age over about 11,000 years and under about 350,000, because that's how long humans have been here on the planet in our current speciation. Throughout that time, 350,000 years ago, give or take, up to about 11,000 years ago, what human beings ate was unequivocally, absolutely, without any question, that means, meat and fat of animals almost no plant material of any kind whatsoever. Makes sense because for most of that time, the earth was frozen over and there wasn't too many plants to be had, frankly. Um, so that's kind of, that's a definite answer. That's what we have eaten. That's how our body plans are. That's basic common sense. But the absolute slam dunk, other than the nitrogen testing that says that's what we did eat. You look at our metabolic pathways and you look at how they, what the systems are and how they work and how they interact. And the question is, are our metabolic pathways designed that 
we can do well consuming a diet which is mixed in terms of most notably carbohydrates and fats at the same time? The answer is no. We have a, it's called a cycle, and I don't know why, because it's not a cycle. We have parts of our um, metabolic pathway that work together in a certain way. It's called the Randall cycle because it was proposed originally by a bloke called Sir Philip Randall in about 1962 or 63. So this is not new information. We've known about this a long time. What Philip Randall proposed was that anytime you have a significant amount of both fat and carbohydrate in your diet at the same time, those two nutrients will lock each other out or cross compete each other out for access to the mitochondria for oxidative phosphorylation to produce ATP for metabolic work. Think of it this way. Two fat men trying to push their way through a revolving door designed for one at the same time and being ever harder pushed from behind by fat men on each side. That's basically the most simple analogy for the Randall cycle I can come up with, really. I love that. So what you get is if you eat a diet that's rich in fat and protein, no problem. Your body will metabolize the fat for energy and use the protein for body structures. Any excess fat will be stored on your body as fat, pretty much, because the body is thrifty and it won't be wasting resources. And it will save that for a rainy day because also we evolved not eating every day, let alone four and five times a day. We ate every other day, every third day, when we were lucky enough to take down a beast, basically. Um, so there's that. Um, if you if you take in a diet that's rich in carbohydrate and has some protein in it, sure, and is poor in fats, the Randall cycle won't be a problem for you either unless you intake a vast amount of carbohydrate, which a lot of these people do. So that's fine as well in terms of the Randall cycle. But one of those diets, the one that's rich in protein and animal fat, and the one that's rich in plant materials but poor in animal products, one of those diets is destitute of nutrition required by a human being. And one of them is not. So while you alleviate the short-term issue, the Randall cycle, you subject yourself to the very real probability of catastrophic health failure down the track if you don't eat a species-appropriate, species-specific diet of the flesh. And by flesh, I mean muscle meat, not organs, muscle meat and fat of large ruminant animals, no plants. Okay. What is the problem with the Randall cycle being activated all the time? Well, the Randall cycle is not an on-off switch. It's more like a fader that you would pull up and down on an audio board. It has a hysteresis, which means it's, it's like an inertia. You can pull the fader immediately by changing what you eat, but there is a time delay on that effect filtering through to your metabolic system. And it can be several hours before your body reacts and changes direction in terms of your metabolic state. So while ever you've got all this vast overplus of energy in your bloodstream and ergo, therefore trying to enter your cells to be oxidized for energy, fats and carbohydrates, this mixture, you're awash with, with substrate to use for that. Your mitochondria is jammed up because of the fat men trying to get through the door. Nothing can get through, or a lot less, because it's a fader, not non-off. What happens then is that the redox potential of the cells will drop because the cells will be using up the energy. Nonetheless, the energy can't flow through because they're cross-competing each other out. When that happens, the amount of ATP that you can produce drops. So the amount of work that your cells can do drops, firstly. And secondly, the concentration of ADP plus inorganic phosphate builds up in the cell. Inorganic phosphate binds to a whole bunch of cytokines, pro-inflammatory pro cytokines, and activates them and turns them on. When you become inflamed, it's because 
inorganic phosphate has bound to that cytokine and set that system off. So you're going to spend three, four, five hours inflamed because you've eaten the mixed diet. And then it'll all filter through and everything will stabilize and you'll go back to normal and that'll be fine. By which stage you'll feel hungry again and you'll repeat that again. You'll eat another meal that's mixed in terms of carbohydrate and fat and you will inflame yourself again for the next four or five. You'll spend your whole life inflamed, basically. And inflammation is the absolute underpinning cause, the etiology of atherosclerosis heart disease. That's an inflammatory response, not a lipid problem at all okay further to heart disease it's the cause of type 2 diabetes heading towards type 1 diabetes all sorts of autoimmune conditions most forms of dementia basically all the big killers in western society they are all underpinned by chronic chronic systemic inflammation as a result of eating a diet which is inappropriate for your species Simple as that. What is the answer? Stop eating plants. 